Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And in this one, I'm going to be covering my round two game from the Southwest class. Um, if you saw the round one game, you saw I had a, a, a nice clean game with black against an FM. And in this one, I was playing down again. Um, and that's the nature of the beast um, when you're playing an open tournament. So hopefully it's just keep that continuity going. Um, my opponent in round two was Shalev Obervi. Um, I'd never heard of him, but that is actually often the case in American Opens these days with so many young juniors. Uh, my opponent this time, I think, is probably like, look like they're 11 or 12, but you never really know how old they are. Um, and uh, yeah, they're actually always underrated. That's the problem in American Opens, actually, is many of the young players just don't have enough FIDE games under their belt um, because there aren't as many FIDE tournaments around in the States. So uh, as a consequence, a lot of these players don't have enough games in them to actually have a accurate rating. And so you'll find that their USCF rating, which is their national rating, is often 200 or sometimes even 300 points higher than their FIDE rating. And um, it's a bit unfortunate because if you're trying to go for a norm, you know, you need to play opponents that have high, um, you know, FIDE ratings. So I think his uh, FIDE at this time in February 2019 was like something like 1900 or 18 something. And that's like, come on, this guy is not that, especially if they are, you know, they're one and oh, they mean that means they won in the first round up. Um, you know, it's just it's just not accurate. So there's a little bit of frustration there that happens, but you know you have to do your job regardless. Um, I sound like Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots. Do your job, do your job. But yeah, you, you got to do it. So in any case, I was white, so I was looking to kind of just attack him from the jump. And uh, I did some preparation just to kind of see what he had been doing. And uh, yeah, I, I uh, felt good about my chances. So I went D4. Shalev played knight F6. Uh, Knight f3, and d6. Um, and d6 is an interesting move order um, because on the one hand, you're saying you're probably going to um, think about uh, playing g6 in the King's Indian. But on the other hand, it's like, why did you play g6 move 2? Because playing g6 move 2, or, or d6 move 2, really isn't necessary if you're trying to play a King's Indian. So the other thought is, well, maybe they're going for an old Indian, and the old Indian plays for e5 um, very early. So the point is you go knight bd7, e5, and you develop the bishop to e7. So d6 actually you know, tells you a lot um, about just the move order and maybe where they're going to put their bishop. Um, and I must confess, I did see that he was taking a liking to this when I looked at a few of his games, the few I could find online. And uh, I kind of expected this. So c4, knight bd7 knight c3, and e5. And yeah, this is the move order um, if you're playing an old Indian defense. It's a little bit passive because white has this all this space, but you're kind of just trying to play bishop e7, castles, and set up on the dark squares and argue that, you know, I have this really healthy dark square chain and, uh, you know, you can't, you have more space, but what else do you have? Prove, prove that you're really better. I was trying to prove it. So I went e4, taking all the space. And now g6 was played, and this was shocking to me because usually if you're playing Old Indian, you're going bishop e7 um, and just castling. But actually in those positions, what you wind up doing is actually castling. Uh, as, as it was after castling, you wind up going rook e8 and bishop f8. Just to give you an example, I've seen stuff like this. Um, bishop e7, bishop e2, castles, castles, rook e1, rook of rookie eight, rookie one, and bishop f8, and then ultimately g6. And so maybe the uh, white's actually or black's actually just saving a lot of time by playing g6 right away. Um, and I think that's actually kind of clever because the only thing that you might consider, hey, maybe I can deal with this uh, with direct play, is maybe you say, what about this exchange variation? And can you argue that? Uh, that you know playing g6 was premature and i was looking at this position um over the board in my mind and i was like i don't know if i can really take advantage of uh of this g6 move in any way and 
Um, I, I just I'm not buying it. I've 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 weakened some squares of my own by this exchange, particularly the D4 square. And once Black plays C6 covering the D5 square, I don't even have that outpost. So I actually couldn't find a way to, you know, refute the idea. And you know, it might present itself as a a nice try um, for any Black players out there that may play the King's Indian. Try the old Indian with this move order with G6. Now the one flaw with it clearly is that you are giving up a lot of space. So I'm I'm gonna you know keep the space and see what happens. I went bishop d3, um, a little bit unusual to put the bishop there. Um, normally e2 would be more natural, um, just not in the way of the queen protecting the d-pawn. You'll find a lot of openings, uh, particularly d4 openings with white. You're kind of ill-advised to have a bishop um, on the d-file in the way of the of the queen because it breaks the connection um, of the queen kind of you know holding together the pawns. So, but I had a very specific idea in mind. After bishop g7, I went bishop I went castles, and now after castles, I went bishop c2. And this was actually the crux of the idea, is that is to almost play like a uh, to invite a Maroxy bind type structure. If e takes d4, knight takes d4, I have a Maroxy bind. And also, at the same time, if the structure gets closed and I wind up playing d5, the bishop on c2 might actually be better than the one that's on e2. The reason for it is that it's directly eyeing the f5 break. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's just some merit to that. It's also protecting e4. So if I ever close the bishop with d5, after knight c5, the pawn on e4 is already protected, so I can play b4 with tempo. So there are, there's some merit behind putting the bishop on c2. So e takes d4 is played, knight takes d4, and knight b6. And I really, really don't like this move. I thought it was a step in the wrong direction. Um, the reason for that is because this knight almost reminds me of this knight that happens in the Alakine defense where it gets chased around from f6 to d5 to b6. And once it's on b6, it's really... Not very bad piece. It doesn't have entry squares to the center. And so as long as I just protect this pawn, um, which I did with b3, this knight is really not doing anything. Instead, I would have, I thought um, a better move um, would have probably been rook e8. Just, you know, the normal kind of king's Indian slash old Indian move, get the rook to the to the file, I the e4 pawn, and then maybe think about playing c6 or a5. But you you want to keep this knight on d7 so that it maybe goes to c5 or e5. Um, b6, I think, is a step in the wrong direction. So knight b6, b3, and now knight g4. Another kind of puzzling move to me because um, I didn't see where this knight was really going that really meant anything. Um, I guess you might think queen h4 is an idea, but I just wasn't buying this. I went f3 to challenge the knight. The only question to me, actually, in this position after knight g4 was how to challenge the knight, whether to go h3 or f3. Um, I could go f h3 and then with the knight moves play for f4, um, or I could go f3 and keep maintain my Maroxy bind pawn setup. I reasoned that uh, I might as well just play this Maroxy bind setup because that's kind of what I wanted to do anyway. So after f3, knight e5 was played. And now I went bishop e3, just developing. Um, and again, you can see I have this really, really nice harmonious setup right now. Um, the only thing I had to keep in mind was actually, believe it or not, sacrifices on c4. One of the things that occurred to me is that this knight on b6 is so bad that it might actually just, you know, sacrifice itself just because. And I thought it, you know, normally in these Maroxy bond setups, you have this, you know, nice light square pawn chain. Um, these two knights here, and then you go queen d2. And I thought with the queen on d2, if the knights ever sacrificed on c4, I w would have to give up my light, my dark squared bishop, and maybe black would have some activity compensation in some of those lines. So I was really wary about the sacrifice even now um, as a potentiality. So anyways, bishop e3, and now f5 was played, and f5 I really don't like in particular because that's what the bishop on c2 is kind of designed to discourage. Um, the point is, is that after e takes f5, which I did, and g takes f5, you have a situation where black has managed to get f5, but the issue is these pawns are split. 
and these pawns are actually kind of weaknesses. They're actually kind of like hanging pawns. Um, if you play openings with uh, such as the, the, the Queen's Indian or actually maybe a better opening to describe as the Terrish, where black has these hanging pawns on c5 and d5, these, this pawn on f5 and this pawn on h7, they're kind of like almost like hanging pawns because they're isolated and weak. And so I really wanted to deal with those weaknesses. And so I decided to address it first by playing queen d2, just connecting my rooks. Now, I, I did point out a little while ago that, you know, this this queen and bishop uh, battery, I was kind of concerned about knight takes c4. But the reason I was not at all worried here, because is if you sacrifice the knight to get the two pieces, uh, to get two pawns and get my dark square bishop, I actually just have bishop b3 skewering the king. So no problems yet. Uh, queen f6 was played, um, developing the queen, fair enough. Um, maybe thinking about f4 at some point, fair enough. Um, you know, f4 is a little bit double-edged, but it does take some space over the on the board. Um, again, now the queen and the bishop are potentially lining up against this d4 knight. So I, again, I do have to be aware of this knight takes d4 sacrifice. But here it's not a problem because I have that bishop b3 move. So I went knight d e2. The idea was to reinforce this knight on c3 and also just stop uh, uh, any pawn from going to f4 because I thought this square could be an asset for one of my pieces. So after knight d e2, king h8, again, makes a lot of sense. Um, getting out of the way of this diagonal, um, so I sound like a broken record, but the sacrifice on c4 is maybe possible. And then additionally, rook g8 might be an idea getting counterplay on the g line. Black has to play dynamically to take advantage of, or to sort of counterbalance his weaknesses. So I went bishop g5, um, harassing the queen and getting uh, the bishop off of uh, off of the e3 square just so to discourage c4 stuff. Queen g6, and then f4. And now I felt really good because not only am I hitting this knight, also this bishop is lined up against this queen, so it just seems like I'm pushing black back and this tactically, this uh, this diagonal is going to be loose. Knight c6 was played. Um, uh, and after knight c6, I played a move I was very, very proud of. I thought it was just a very, very elegant move. Um, and uh, maybe you could take a moment to think about it. So I'll give you a moment. All right, and the move I played was first rook ae1, getting the rook centralized. This was actually not the moment I wanted you to think on. I apologize for that. Um, but after bishop e6, now I actually played the move knight b5. Um, and the move knight b5 I thought was very, very elegant because you reroute the knight to a really potentially nice square on d4 with tempo also eyeing the c7 pawn. I just thought that was a really nice way to you get the rook out the way, and then this knight on d b5, which was, you know, the knight on c3, which was kind of not, was not really going anywhere fast with this, uh, the pawn on f5 here. I thought it's really nice to just reposition it. Note that I also have this d5 square I could put the knight on, but I thought that was letting black off the hook too easy because black really desperately needs exchanges to deal with the lack of space. So I really did not want to let uh, black off the hook that easy. And so I thought knight b5 was really clever. Rook a8 is pretty much forced. You have to defend that pawn. And now I go knight d4, and I maneuver with tempo to hit the bishop. And it's pretty clear as if, if I get the bishop on e6, the position is going to collapse because f5 is so weak. So bishop d7, retreating move, went backwards. And now I think is another moment um, uh, that is pretty interesting where I went for g4. And g4 looks totally wacko, totally counter, uh, counter to the positional game I've been playing. But it's just, it's just tactically justified. The f5 pawn is so chronically weak and the queen is on g6, so it's like, why not? 
I mean, if you just count the attackers, there's one, two, three attackers. And there are three defenders on the pawn. But you note that um, black has two heavy piece defenders, which shouldn't be traded for minor pieces. So um, just uh, the tactics just work out in white's favor. After g4, h6 was played challenging my bishop. But I didn't think that really mattered very much and just play g takes f5. And, you know, it might seem a little bit strange. What are you doing? This king, isn't it just like you're opening up the king for an assault? And the truth is my pieces are just so much more active that uh, there's no problems with my own king. Queen h5 was played, getting the queen out the way. And now I went knight takes c6, b takes c6, and then knight g3. This was the other part of my plan is that I harassed the queen and uh, this bishop on g5 is going to be secure because this queen is really, really not going anywhere. Note that if you make a move like queen g4, um, I can even play a move like f6. Uh, there's also bishop d1. There's just all these options. Queen h3 was played instead. Um, you know, on a square that it's not harassed. And the point is, well, isn't this bishop a little bit loose? Um, and isn't my, you know, pawn in f5 maybe going to be a little bit of a weakness? And my rationale here was, look, I have three pieces playing on the, three minor pieces playing on the king side. And, uh, ooh, I didn't play rook e4. And this knight on b6 is just out of the game, totally out of the game. You notice it's totally dominated. It can't get anywhere fast. And because of that, I'm just playing a piece up. So uh, I think white is just winning. Now, the winning move here, uh, the most direct move that wins is one that I did not play. And uh, the move is actually rook e7. Now, I was looking at lines, you know, tactically where I do give up this bishop because I'm already up. I already have one pawn. And I thought if I have two connected pawns on the first rank, that is pretty dangerous. But for some reason, I just didn't bring myself to do it. I thought it might be a little bit risky. Truth is, if I stuck to what I knew, which is the fact this knight has shut out the game, it would be easy to make the sacrifice because I'm just uh, playing uh, with an extra piece here anyway. So if the bishop would be taken, I take like this, and it's so clear to see that these pawns are running. Um, and f6 becomes an immediate threat. A sample line could be bishop e5. This is kind of what I was a little bit concerned about is the bishop coming out of the chain, getting some threats on my own king. But now I can actually just go f6, and you can see now just how barren the king without pawns is. I mean, I have rook h7 check as a threat, even queen d3 and rook h7. Uh, it's just totally over, um, totally over. So if I want to end it much quicker, I could have just, you know, gone for this. Um, and again, tactics have been my weak point. If you've seen any of the games uh, in the Road to Grandmaster journey thus far, you've seen that. I have missed quite a few tactical opportunities. So anyways, I went f6, which I thought was the next best option. Uh, I'm giving the pawn back, but I still have an extra pawn on the queen side. This knight is still stuck on b6, and this king is pretty airy on h8. Additionally, I can get active on the seventh rank, and that's what I did. I went rook e7, um, thinking that, okay, my rook is on the seventh rank, um, I should have something here. Black played rook cf8, doubling the rooks. Um, and now I went for queen d3. And this was the second part of my plan to play rook h7 or queen h7, uh, depending on the circumstance. Note that queen h7 is checkmate. Um, so the only move to parry this um, would be rook 6 f7. The point is is that you block off the 7th rank and so I don't have queen h7 and after a subsequent trade it's actually not the most clear the most clear it's not actually super clear how I uh, you know win the game but I thought that I could slow play the victory um, with a line like queen d4 check rook g7 and f5 and it just looked, it appeared to me that, you know, with this queen pinning the rook, so there's no sacrifice here just yet, um, with this f pawn cutting the connection between the queen and the bishop, and with this knight on b6, again, in jail, 
um, I should probably win the game. Um, instead, Black actually made a move that was a real howler and a huge shocker to me because it just completely misses the mark. And the move was Rook 8 F7. Now, it looks like, you know, you know, what's the difference? How does this really matter? But actually, it matters a great deal which rook you move. And the reason it does is because of rook fe1. Uh, now, the issue is that um, I'm threatening a very, very uh, menacing checkmate with rook e8. And uh, the point is that if I give up that, ex if I'm give after bishop takes e8, giving, uh, giving the exchange to black temporarily, I have queen h7 mate once the king actually steps up. And so the difference is, is when rook 6 f7 is played, if that was actually played, if rook e1, I'm not actually threatening rook e8 because black has two pieces on that square. Um, whereas when the 8 rook step up, if the rook on f8 steps up, it's not actually covering that square enough. And so the issue is actually after rook fe1, rook e8 is a major threat. And the irony of it all is that the rook on f7 can't go back because of queen h7 mate. So black is actually completely lost, and there's no way to avoid just a massive loss of material. I think the computer was giving bishop f5, which just gives up a piece. Um, so it's just totally lost. Um, black instead went rook takes f4, but again, it does not solve the problem of rook e8. And uh, after bishop takes e8, rook takes e8, uh, black actually resigned because after king g7, um, I think we can all see the mate in one here, uh, queen g6 checkmate. So relatively clean game for me. Um, uh, I did expect the old Indian, um, and so uh, I got a position I had looked at and had a new idea, new plan in the position. And um, I do need to work on my tactics. I'm still not... Uh, not great with tactics. I'm good with the maneuvering. I know how to, you know, stick a needle a little bit, but uh, I do need to be more sharp and precise when the game gets to the critical moments. So something to work on, but glad I got the W. All right, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. You can uh, like or subscribe to the channel. That'd be awesome. And if you want to support uh, the Road to Grandmaster, you can do so by uh, checking out the PayPal description in the link below. Thanks. Take care.